Good morning. My name is Katie Berger, and I'm a member here at Twin City Bible Church, and I'm so excited to be with you all this morning. Um, For those of you online, welcome as well. And all of you, if you'd like to have a bulletin to follow along with the words and the readings, you can find that online at tcbc.cc backslash bulletin. And now let's go ahead and turn our attention from all the things that have gone on all morning to settle in intentionally to the Lord's presence together by reading our call to worship. So I'd invite you on Zoom or here in the sanctuary to stand, and we'll read together. We have gathered to declare to the Lord, you are our Lord. Apart from you, we have no good thing. We will praise the Lord who counsels us. Even in the darkest of nights, he gives us wisdom. Therefore, our hearts are glad and our tongues will rejoice. We rest secure. Make known to us the path of life. You will fill us with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand.
Part of our service this morning, we would like to take the chance actually to greet one another. So if we can go ahead and get back on our feet a couple of minutes and check in with someone you haven't seen in a while or maybe that you don't even know and ask what's going on with the end of your summer. We're all on the approach if, if some of the year-round school is already in the school year, but we're the approach of things starting back up. So let's check in, find out what people have planned for these last few weeks in August for a couple of minutes here. And online, you can text or uh, drop something in the chat to say hello. Well, again, my name is Katie Berger, and I'm a member here at Twin City Bible Church, and I'm so glad to welcome you all here and to see all of the catching up. We must have some exciting end of the summer plans as we talk to one another. Um, and that's just a little taste of part of what TCBC is about. Our vision, our mission here is to see campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world. And so as we engage with one another, as we know each other deeply in community, it's our purpose to know Christ better and then to take what we know of him, let that transform us and take it out into the world as we go from here. So may those little moments of community connection, of saying the call to worship together, of hearing the word preached, be the things that reinforce what's true in our soul and give us something that we can take out and offer the world. And if that excites you like it excites me, and you'd like to hear more, I'd love to invite you to fill out our connection card. So we have an online card. There's also, if you're in the sanctuary, a paper card you can fill out. That just gives us a little info about you and we will follow up to get to know you better. And even if you're a returning member and you've been here lots of times, it's really helpful if you just take a minute to fill that out so that we can have an idea of who's been joining us. Also, if you're new, we have a little welcome gift. It's this snazzy TCBC mug. It's in the welcome center in the back, so please stop by and pick that up and get a chance to meet our greeters there at the end of service this morning. A couple of other ways to get to know Twin City Bible Church besides just being here this morning. One is our online family room, which is on Facebook. And I have found that even uh, as we have a little more chance to interact than the height of pandemic, a great place to get to know people a little more, to see what announcements, things are going on in people's lives. So make sure to check that out. We also have our TCBC website, a very standard place to find info, and there's lots to find out about there. And for me, there's the weekly email, which is how I organize my calendar for everything related to the church. So please sign up for that if you haven't already, and you can get all the info. And we also have ways to connect with one another in prayer. 
So we'll highlight this morning our prayer wall. It's online. You can post a prayer request. You can pray for prayer requests. You can like a request someone else has put there. It's a great way to experience community and pray for one another. Then a couple of ways we can all be involved in community in these few weeks. One is we are about to do a name tag refresh. So, so yeah, woo! Start of a new school year, start of a new chance to be getting to know one another, and the start of a new chance to have a new name tag. So if you have a name tag made already, and it's on one of the boards out there, and you are especially attached to it, feel free to pick it up this morning because in the interim, they will be recycled, and we will come in and design freshly in the next few weeks our name tags for the school year. Our last way to all get uh, checked in with one another in these coming weeks is our picnic next Sunday after church at Carl Park. So plan to join us there, bring your own lunch, and it'll be a chance to hang out and fellowship and enjoy one another. And with that, we'll invite Pastor Brian up. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Wow, you're so excited to see me. (laughs) Um, Well, I'm still excited to see you regardless. Uh, And in fact, I'm really excited about the announcement that I'm going to make here. Back in March, uh, we introduced to you all that we would be in the search for a new children's ministry director. Brenda Stevens had served the role as an interim director for, uh, finished out almost two years, and we're grateful for Brenda. And we entered, as a, as a congregation, we entered a season of prayer, really asking God to direct uh, the right person uh, into this role. And it was in June that um, I first got to meet this family here, the Egley family, and Melissa Egley, you could stand up. And uh, she, they started attending our church. <laughs> Melissa's been doing children's ministry uh, off and on pretty much since 2006. Uh, in another church, and so she has a tremendous heart for for children. If you get around her, you'll you'll see her passion, both her and Paul, and um, and the Lord has answered our prayer. And so, in the process of our search committee, uh, talking to her, interviewing her, uh, and and unanimously voting for her as our candidate, then passing that on to our shepherding team, who got to talk to her and, and unanimously voting for her. Same thing with the staff team and the leadership council. And finally, we want to present Melissa as our candidate to you as the congregation uh, for you to meet her after the service at our Coffee and Connections downstairs. She'll be there to answer any questions. Also, our search committee members will be present if you want to talk to us as well. But we are really excited, and hopefully, you know, by the end of this week, we'll finalize everything to move forward. So God loves our kids, and we're excited to see what he has in store for us going forward. All righty. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to invite Lynn for our congregational prayer. Good morning, TCBC. All right. Thank you for warming up the crowd there. That's all right. Uh, as we head into prayer, uh, there's going to be a couple times that I'm going to pause so the microphone isn't cutting out. I'm not falling asleep. I'm just creating a little space for you to either wait there silently as you listen to God or uh, perhaps you want to silently respond in some way in prayer to our Father. So uh, join me in prayer here this morning. Father God, we do um, praise you um, that you are a God who draws near to us. Uh, we recognize you as our creator and as our king. Uh, you who are above all, the most holy one, you have made yourself known to us through your creation, through your word, uh, through your son, Jesus. Uh, You are king, and yet you desire to enter into a listening relationship with us. And we are amazed that you, the all-powerful one, wants to listen to us. So, Father, for all that may feel overwhelming to us, um, for where we may be experiencing stress and anxiety these days, be at work to not only provide what we need, but also to take us deeper in relationship with you. And Father, for where we see you working uh, in us and around us, I pray for us to be a people who respond in thanksgiving, giving you the glory and you alone.
And Father, for any places where we are unsure or confused, um, I pray that you would bring in your light and wisdom. Would you fill our hearts and our minds with hope and confidence in your goodness to us? And Father, where you are leading us, uh, whether it's individuals or uh, families or our friendships, um, and certainly as a church family, Lord, we pray that as you lead, we would graciously grow, uh, you would graciously grow our faith so that we may follow you in greater humility and in greater obedience um, and confidently trusting in your leadership over our lives. And Father, as we start a new school year, we pray uh, for our community and for our campus. Uh, God, would you prepare our children and teens for the new school year, uh, many who are re-entering um, into uh, in-person uh, learning? Would you go before them, uh, provide friendships, and just a great sense of um, anticipating of, what, uh, of how you are growing them? Lord, we pray, too, for uh, teachers and for school staff and administrators. God, would you help them as they prepare the school year following, a school year like another? Would you give them uh, the strength and the creativity, God, that they need? And, God, we pray for uh, our community as uh, we receive thousands of college students here in the weeks to come. Uh, help us, Lord, uh, to remember to be in prayer. Um, Lord, we pray for these um, Students, um, for their hearts to be tender towards you, that in the midst of this transition in their lives, we pray, Lord, um, that they would uh, sense their need for you and uh, their longing um, to be restored back into a right relationship with you. And God, we pray that TCBC would be part of uh, you making yourself known to the many thousands of students here. And God, we specifically pray for Chris Sanders and his ministry with InterVarsity. Um, Lord, thank you for his work there, and God, in the midst of the different staff transitions and certainly in the midst of student transitions, Lord, would you give him uh, strength and wisdom and insight? God, we pray for the staff team and the students team uh, to be uh, coming together. Um, pray for great uh, strengthening there um, and to help them to be excited and refreshed with the vision, God, that you have called him and the students there um, to, to live out your word and your truth there on campus. Pray, God, um, that, uh, too, for his transition in the midst of becoming a new homeowner. God, thank you for how you've been providing for him. And also for the new eye diagnosis that he's had. Uh, God, would you give both him and the doctors wisdom and knowing how to uh, proceed um, forward in that. Uh, so, Lord, we just pray for his needs here um, as he enters into a new school year. And God, we say thank you for providing um, Melissa as our new children's ministry director. God, thank you for her and Paul and their family. And God, we ask that you would go before them in their transition here uh, to that role. God, would you bless her with energy and creativity? Um, help her, uh, Lord, as she begins to connect uh, with our children and with families here at TCBC. God, we pray too for the McFarlands as they have had twin boys, uh, Archer and Grady. We pray for them to grow strong. And we pray, God, for their entire family as it grows for you to provide the, the rest and the energy and the resources there for them. And, Lord, we pray, too, for Warren Buck, uh, who had bone marrow uh, transplant uh, surgery. Lord, we pray for the success of that procedure and for him to sense your presence here in the midst of the recovery. So, God, open our, our ears, open our hearts, help us to receive your word as Pastor Brian comes forward. Lord, we long to be changed and transformed by your gospel so that we can make that known to our friends and family and to our community here. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're on Zoom, I invite you to uh, mute your video. And children, five through fifth grade, you are dismissed to kids' time. Well, good morning again. Thank you. We'll get there. It's good to see you all. Um, if you're just joining us, either for the first time on Zoom or here in person, we had been going through a series called Rule of Life, 
uh, talking about some of the things that govern our life, our patterns, our decisions, our schedule. We're shifting gears a bit here the, this week and next week as we gear up for what we traditionally think of as the fall, um, the time when students return to campus, and as a church that is committed to and has a heart for reaching students uh, since it's um, church, the church's inception in 1933, that's really important for us. And so um, uh, today's message and next week will be helping gear us towards those ends as campus community uh, coming together, being transformed by Christ to renew the world. So um, we're going to, today's text is Matthew 14. Chapter 1, or not chapter, verses 1 through 21. Matthew 14, 1 through 21, so you can go ahead and start turning there um, as we gear up for the fall. I will say a quick word of prayer and read our text, and we'll be on our way. Father, thank you for your grace this morning. Give us ears to hear and a heart to understand, and help me, Lord, to convey your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read the text this morning about the death of John the Baptist, and you see, we'll see Jesus' response to that, and then we'll see him move into a place of ministry out of a heart of compassion and talk about its impact for our lives. So Matthew 14, 1 through 21. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Then they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is God's word. The title of the message today is Grief-Informed Compassion. Grief-informed, hyphenated word. Grief-informed compassion. Three points that we will talk about from the text are, one, the crisis of loss Secondly, the space to grieve. Thirdly, the resulting compassion. There's a crisis of loss. Then we see Jesus taking space to grieve. And resultingly, uh, he has compassion. Is anybody keeping track? 
Are any of you keeping track of all of the losses that we have been facing, that we have had 18 months, you know, the last 18 months? I mean, it's just, it's really astronomical. I was just thinking about in all of the, you know, sort of apocalyptic movies that are out there, and whether it's the alien invasion or whether it's the, you know, the, the pathogen that invades humanity or whether it's the computers that take over, did anybody ever think we would be wearing these, right? So I'm just like trying to think of all of the sort of Tom Cruise and, and uh, Will Smith versions of Apocalypse. I don't, I don't remember, maybe you, maybe you do, and you can, you can text me later. But just even having to put one of these on for many of us or to see others wearing them is a loss. It's, what, what is this? You know, where are we? And of course, we understand what's going on behind it. But just to acknowledge the fact that that is a loss. We think about coming out of a pandemic, our relationships have been just so discombobulated. I mean, as a church community and churches all over the country and likely the world are losing people. They're getting lost in the process. People have disengaged. And so as a church community, we have lost people. We've lost people for various reasons. Perhaps you've lost friendships. Perhaps during the pandemic, you lost contact with people, or there were people that you would normally see in certain settings, and you just don't anymore. I remember someone mentioning to me that in the pandemic, that they realized that the folks that were their friends were sort of in a pod, but they were on the outside looking in. They realized the loss that they were experiencing. Perhaps you've lost loved ones. Uh, being in New York City, uh, we were, my family and I, in the epicenter of the pandemic on the early stages, and there were so many losses. Every time you heard an ambulance, you understood what was going on because there was so little activity happening because of the virus. The loss of the school year, I mean, on and on. There are so many losses that you and I have faced. I recall our transition out of the city after 16 years culminated with a Zoom goodbye. 16 years, a Zoom goodbye. The losses have piled up. The question is, how do we move from a place of acknowledging loss, embracing grief, and being in a place in our hearts where we could receive new people, where we could be ready for what God wants to do in the fall. How do we make that movement? Well, that's what this text is, is really about. First, let's look at the crisis of lost, loss. We see in the first 12 verses that John the Baptist goes from being a prisoner to being decapitated. It's important that we hold on to that. That is a stark reality. But let's set it up. In verses 1 and 2, we kind of get this preface. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. So he's hearing about Jesus doing these miracles, sending out disciples. And, And Herod says to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Jesus' fame had been spreading. I mean, no Facebook, no, you know, Instagram. All there was was word of mouth. Imagine that. And and so Jesus' fame is spreading. People are talking about all the things that he's doing. And here is the ruler of Galilee and another region. And he's hearing about this. And he's he's saying, John the Baptist must have been raised from the dead. Why is Herod saying that? Because he's got something on his conscience. Verses 3 through 5 says, For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. The Jewish historian Josephus, he's a first century historian, he writes about this situation. So we have understanding of what's going on, the context outside of the Bible. 
And what Josephus tells us is that Herod was married and Herodias was married to his half-brother, Philip. And they fell in love or whatever you want to call it. And they both decided to divorce their spouses, whom were still living, and get married to one another. John the Baptist, being a prophet, being a man of God, being one who is calling people to repentance, has the audacity to confront Herod, the Tetrarch, the ruler, and tell him that by Jewish law, by according to the scriptures, if you read in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, this is wrong. This is sin. You should not take your brother's wife. It is wrong. It is an abomination. And so what does Herod do? Does he listen? Does he say, you know what, John, you're right. No, he doesn't do that. He says, you know what, John, you're going to prison. And so he puts him in prison as a result. He hated to be confronted. He hated to hear that there was something that was done, that he was doing wrong. Because if you think about, if you, if, if you look at Herod, there's something that he reminds us of ourselves. In our flesh, or you could say our false self, the unredeemed part of us, the thing that makes decisions <clears throat> and lives a certain way that is not in submission to God, when, when, when loss and grief comes into your life, you react. You react. You have certain reactions. And, 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 and John, in, in, in Herod's case, he's reacting because his false self, his whole image is about validation. He wants people to like him. He cannot stand that someone would actually criticize him, regardless of the fact of what he was doing was right or wrong. How can I say that? Because we see in verse 5 that although he hated what John was doing, it says that he wanted to put him to death, but he feared the people. He feared his constituents. He cared about their validation. And because of that care for their validation, he couldn't do the thing that he wanted to do. So he said, prison will just have to do. The people held John in high esteem, John the Baptist, to be a prophet. And Jesus did as well. But Herod was a man who sought validation. And when being confronted, being crossed, being pressured, he abused his power and put John in prison. That would have to do until Herod's birthday. His birthday celebration came and he had a great feast and friends and acquaintances gathered together. And they're celebrating him. And he has the daughter of Herodias, his ill-obtained new wife, his daughter, dancing before him and his guests. And she does such a good job that Herod decides, you know what, I want to display my generosity before my guest and tell this girl, I will give you whatever you ask. In another, one of the gospels, it says up to half my kingdom. So whatever you want. I mean, anything that you want, I will give it to you. And what does she do? It says in verse 8, prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And our, our Herod the Tetrarch, we see his need for validation poking its head out again. Finally, in verse 9, it says that he had sorrow. The, with John the Baptist... If, if you think about David, King David, he sinned and he took Bathsheba. When the prophet comes to him, Nathan the prophet comes to him and confronts him about his sin, how does David respond? He's contrite. 
he realizes, oh no, it was me. I was the sinner. He had sorrow. He had grief over his sin. When Herod is committing a similar sin and is confronted by the prophet John the Baptist, how does Herod respond? You're in prison. Herod's response to what should have brought grief was, I'm putting you in your place. I'm fighting this grief. I'm not going to acknowledge it as I should. His false self reared its head. The first time that we see John, or Herod actually being sorry or having sorrow in verse 9 is he's realizing now I have painted myself in a corner. I care about validation. And the people, they revere John. I can't put him to death. But now in front of my dinner guests, I have been told by the girl that I gave any request, John the Baptist's head on the platter. He's in a conundrum. He's in a corner. He's, somebody's going to be sad. Somebody is going to be let down, either those in front of him or his constituents. He felt sorry, finally, but for the wrong reasons. Not because of, not because of putting John in prison, not because of his sin, but because he was going to not be validated by someone. The reality is when you and I are... Confronted with sorrow and grief and loss, we have a false self that reacts as well. I mean, our false self may be summarized in various statements. It may be that I want to be viewed as strong even when I feel inside that I'm weak. And we project that. Or maybe your false self says, your flesh says, I want to be viewed as competent, even when I don't feel competent. And so you project that. You work to make sure that that is known. Or when sorrow or loss comes into my life, I want to make sure that I'm the one who's getting justice. I want to be seen as the one who is the, the, has the, the gumption to respond Herod responds out of his false self. But we see in contrast how Jesus will respond to grief and sorrow. Point two, space to grieve. Space to grieve. How does Jesus respond to the news of John being beheaded? And remember, Jesus is, he's our redeemer. He is our example of true life in the spirit. He represents the true self. We are being, those of us in Christ are being renewed day by day more into his image. We are created to be like Christ Jesus. In Luke 4, 14, 13, it says that now when Jesus heard this, when he heard about John being beheaded, when he heard this whole situation, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. What is he doing? Well, among other things, he's grieving. And if you harmonize this with the other Gospels, you'll see at some point or other, the other disciples, the disciple, his disciples join him. They're in a desolate place. They had gone out and they were doing ministry and they come back and he's saying, come, let's rest together. The time that's elapsed, unbeknownst to us, was it hours, was it days? We don't know. But Jesus withdraws. Jesus doesn't you see, so our temptation is loss comes into our life and we just get busy. We want to bury that loss. We want to bury that grief. We just don't want to feel it. We don't want to have to deal with it. So pack the schedule, do more stuff. Or perhaps on the other end of things, we enter into that space of grief and we stay there and we put up walls. No one else can come in. Jesus does neither of these. He demonstrates what it is like to have true grief as, a, as one in life in the spirit. He doesn't bury it under activity. Jesus doesn't go and engage in more busy ministry. He actually, his fame is spreading, but he withdraws. And if you've been with us the last several weeks, you kind of see that you see this pattern now 
uh, developing uh, as we study his life at various points. We might try to deny grief and ignore it. Jesus is doing something deliberate. He's withdrawing from all of the attention. By the way, that would be my tendency to just sort of suppress it, just ignore it. Perhaps you would try to fight the loss and go after the one that created the situation. Imagine, I mean, it's, it's, it's so fascinating the amount of restraint that Jesus demonstrates. I mean, here is a picture of one king, Herod, who abuses his power to get what he wants. But then we have the true king, Jesus, who offers restraint. I mean, think about all the power Jesus had at the snap of a finger. Jesus has more power than Thanos in one snap. <laughs> I mean, he could have called angels down. One angel, it says that the Assyrians killed 185,000 men in the Old Testament. One angel. He could have called a legion. Think about the justice Jesus could have evoked or he could have uh, provoked upon um, Herod, just the snap of a finger, but he offers restraint. He doesn't fight it. He doesn't let the anger get the best of him. He doesn't blame God or others. We don't see the activity of what Jesus is doing and his withdrawing, but we know, first of all, we know that he felt it because he is 100% human. He's just like you and I, as well as God. He's 100% God, 100% human. Secondly, when Lazarus died, what did Jesus do? He wept. He showed emotion. So certainly, his cousin, John the Baptist, his forerunner in ministry, who's been in prison unjustly, unjustly put in prison, and now executed in this horrific fashion. We can't view Jesus as a robot just moving on, unmoved. He felt the pain of that. He grieved the loss, the injustice. And we know that Jesus being a Jewish rabbi would have leaned into some of the lamentations or the Psalms of lament, those would have been resonant in his heart. And we could say that with ease because what is he saying on the cross? He's quoting the Psalms. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22, one. That's the words of Jesus on the cross. As believers, we do not grieve as the world grieves. We don't grieve as those who do not have hope, Paul says in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. We don't grieve as those who do not have hope. We have hope. And so our story is one of redemption, which means that grief is not something we bury or just move on from or ignore, but neither is it something that overwhelmingly dictates our life. There is a movement towards hope in our grief. That is the story of the scripture. Jesus likely would have leaned into the Psalms. Some would say half, up to half or more of our Psalms, of the 150, are Psalms of lament. And when if you study them deeper, of all of those Psalms of lament, there's only one that does not end with a sound of hope. Every other psalm of lament, there is a movement towards hope. Psalm 22, I mentioned it earlier. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, by verse 22, that was verse 1, the psalm, David is saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Moving from God has forsaken me to God, I will praise you. The movement towards hope. Psalm 73, verses 2 and 3. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The psalmist is disoriented because those that don't follow God are prospering. How is this possible? There's so much grief and sorrow around that reality. But by, by verse 16 of Psalm 73, he says, But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to be to me a wearisome task. 
until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned therein. And he moves on and says in verse 25, whom, and, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. He moved from, God, why is this happening? How could you allow the wicked to prosper to, Lord, whom do I have in heaven but you? It's a movement towards hope. That is the story of believers. When we grieve, we grieve. The feelings are real. There is no bypassing that. But as we grieve, we are framed in our grief by hope. As we experience loss, we are, or we, our loss is framed by the hope that we have in Jesus. If you look at the book of Lamentations, five chapters of extensive grief over the destruction of Jerusalem. But in the middle of it, in chapter 3, Jeremiah says this, verses 21 to 23, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The story of Job, a man of anguish and great sorrow and loss, lost his family, lost his possessions, and in the midst of that loss, Though he is groping for answers, Job 19, 25, and 26, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon her earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. Grief for a believer, for a Christian, is a movement of, from the reality of the pain, of the loss, an acknowledgement of that, into a place of hope. And finally, we see in that hope a response of compassion from our Lord. The resulting compassion. Verses uh, 13b to 14 of Luke 14. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. I don't know if maybe you're a morning person or not, or maybe you would say, I'm not a morning person, don't bother me. I see some heads shaking. Uh, or if you're like, I turn it in early, so don't bother me. Imagine if a crowd, if you're not a morning person, shows up at your door, 6 a.m., hey, we're here. How are you going to respond? Oh, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> or you're turning out the lights, and you're not a night person, and you're about to go to bed, and 100 folks show up at your door, ding dong. Hey, you know, we just wanted to have some fellowship. Uh, sorry, right? Wrong house. <laughs> Think about what Jesus has just experienced. The loss of his relative, his friend, his forerunner in ministry, not just in an ordinary way, not just natural causes. He was executed, beheaded. And Jesus goes and withdraws, and he's with his disciples, and then crowds of people start showing up. Jesus doesn't say, go away. It says he responds in compassion. How does he do that? I mean, he is the Lord, of course, but he's also incarnate. He's also with a flesh like ours. He makes that movement in hope, the, the pain towards hope, and he's able to respond in compassion, doesn't bury the pain, he doesn't skip over it, doesn't grow resentful. He's able to respond in compassion. And what I find so amazing and beautiful is that Jesus is able to meet with the Lord in his grief in the desolate place. And then he's able to meet the needs of others in a desolate place. He's able to connect his own need and his own need for comfort in a place where there is not provision or comfort. And then when people are in a deep need, in a similar desolate place, 
he's able to provide that comfort out of a heart of compassion. And that's what God is calling us to have movement toward as we move toward this fall season. He goes on, and when the disciples are wanting to send them away in verses 15 and 16, the day's over, it's a desolate place, let them go buy food. Jesus says, don't send them away. They don't need to go away. Let's feed them. You're going to feed them. And then, of course, is the miraculous provision, the five loaves, the two fish, and not just a snack, but Jesus actually has them sit down. The word in the Greek is similar to what is referred to in the great feast, the messianic feast, where they're going to recline. Jesus provides a meal in the desert. He provides a banquet with little provision. In a place where, himself, where he himself has experienced grief and loss, he moves towards compassion, and he's able to bring great provision. It's a story of where we are ultimately headed as a people, that we will all be gathered one day into that great banquet, where we will, we will recline with all believers from all times in the presence of our Lord at the great feast in heaven. What does this mean for us? How does the church family, we embrace new people, new students, even as we deal with our own grief, our own losses, loss of friends, loss of a school year, loss of all, you know, normalcy? Well, we have to embrace the loss. We have to feel what we feel. We have to feel our feelings. We have to acknowledge it. As Jesus did, we can't bury it in our false response. We can't move on from it or ignore it. We can't, just move, we can't just react in our flesh. We have to accept it. We have to receive what God is doing and recognize he is sovereign. Even in the weirdest of times, God is sovereign. He is here. We have to have space to grieve. But we also have to recognize in our grief as we look to the scripture and the movement of grief and scripture towards hope, that grief is always redeemed for believers. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 6, that as they were suffering and received comfort, that they were in turn able to comfort others with the comfort that they had received. Loss is a gift, friends. It is a gift to us to draw us nearer to the Father, to bring us to a point where we are no longer reacting out of our false self, but are in a space where we can be transformed by Christ and accept what God is doing and see him use our grief to be a blessing and the comfort we've received to others. May that be the case in the days and the weeks to come, Twin City Bible Church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. We pray and ask, help us to embrace the losses that you've given us, to not react against them, but to move in a place of grief and acknowledging our pain into a place of hope and compassion for others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian. It's, um, I'm aware in myself, as it felt like a month ago, the pandemic was kind of in a different spot than it feels like now, that that stirred in me a bit of anxiety, a bit of grief, as things aren't going quite how I expected. And the invitation to press into the fact that the feelings are real, but the hope is too, feels really important to me as we head towards, I work on campus and campus ministry, as we head towards a year that doesn't look quite the way I thought it would a month ago. How do I press in and experience that transformation from the Lord as his presence with me in the hope and the grief? And then live that out in a way that brings that to the community on campus and even in this church. So I invite you along with me to be processing that, let that settle in our hearts as we continue in our service now. There are a couple of ways we can respond. One is through the connection card that's in front of you here in the, in the sanctuary. 
It's also online in the link above. And there's a spot to write on the back of the card or on the online form just a little bit of what you're processing or any questions you have or a prayer request. You might take a moment as we enter into musical worship to do that. We can also respond with prayer, and you can head over to our prayer wall, tcbc.cc backslash prayer wall, if you'd like to put a prayer request up. And we can respond as we hear the word and we think about the transformation we want to see in our church and in the community by the giving of our tithes and offerings to support that. And so we will be passing the plate here in the sanctuary, and you can also give at the link online. So let's take our attention to the Lord and join in music together.
And now let's receive the benediction. It comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 2 Thessalonians, rather. Um, chapter 2. Now may the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Be blessed as you go this week. Now let's sing the doxology. Praise God.